Today we start with a new series of improv lectures um, regarding the ten Mahavidyas, which are ten goddesses, some well known, some less well known, which are also ten great um, truths or, or bodies of knowledge. No, vidya means knowledge, avidya means ignorance. No? So, Maha means great, like Mahatma Gandhi, you know, great guy. And so, in that way, uh, these ten truths are there, and uh, they are obviously very old, but they have been mostly in 19th century. Uh, being put forward very much by Ganapati Muni, who was a, a student of Ramana Maharishi. And I think that is very, very relevant. It is even said that uh, Ramana Maharishi wrote part of that story, or dictated part of that story to Ganapati Muni. And some people will even say, like, actually this book is from Ramana Maharishi, but he did not want to like have it published in his own name because he did not want to confuse his students by bringing something else than what he was normally teaching which is you know basic advaita vedanta jhana yoga which are uh, the uh, self study the self observation but so i like to start with that story because yeah that's really how it is. All these different approaches, all these different point of views, and all these different practices, they are really one. And this is also how they have been uh, practiced and experienced and discussed in, uh, in India since thousands of years. And then, okay, when that story then came to to the West, you know, um, that then was simplified. You know? And then we get this one absolute truth of the Self in Advaita Vedanta, the non-dual reality, that which never changes, that which always stays the same, is always in peace, is always in bliss. I don't think I have to explain this because this is very basic. So, we kind of got served that, and of course, very logical in a way, because it's the first truth, is the absolute truth, is the, you know, basis uh, of, of yoga philosophy. But um, it does not stand on its own. And then definitely, when we look into practice, it does not stand on its own. But also, in our understanding of life, it does not stand on its own, because next to this absolute truth, this, there are also many other truths which are just as absolute. Maybe not as uh, all-encompassing, you know, not as uh, great <laughs> as that one truth of the Self, which really holds all these other truths. They are more, you could say, manifested truths, but they are also absolute. Just like the Self is absolute, they are absolute. And in that way, they are very interesting to study and enhance in this way our understanding of, of who we are and life and so on. But most of all, they also lead to certain practices we can, which can be uh, very beneficial to us and uh, help us forward to live a more fruitful life, a life, I would say, in Dharma, in harmony with everything, because we much better understand everything. No? In Typical, I would say, Western style Advaita Vedanta, you're basically being told, just shut up, just don't want anything, don't desire anything, don't do anything, just stop and everything will be resolved. And this is, of course, true, but very hard to do. And in that way, these truths of the Mahavidyas actually give us some tools with which we can work more, more easily, so that we can live more a harmonious life and have better progress on uh, the path of yoga, because these ten truths, these ten bodies of knowledge, are also at the same time ten powers, ten yeah, energies, you can say, which you can bring into your life and which will make it so much more easy to put the theory into practice. 
So we will look at that and uh, important also of course to mention is that these goddesses are not just symbolic, they are energies that exist, no? maybe not in the form that we make of it, no? uh, but they are energies that exist, that are manifested directly from, you can say, oh, okay, cosmic consciousness, God, the Absolute, whatever you want to name it, and in that way they are also energies with which we can communicate, with which we can work together, and so then a lot of tantric practices come into view where we are doing certain rituals, we are, do, we are doing certain worship, so that this energy we can bring it into our lives, bring it into our bodies, bring it into our minds, and in that way live it much more uh, strongly than let's say when we are just thinking about it. And next to that, next to those let's say bhakti rituals, there are also uh, certain meditative practices which are related to it, which can also be very helpful. But so, this as a general introduction to the Mahavidyas, you will, you know, get to know them one by one. Today we're starting with the first, which is Kali, and uh, there now we will move further to Tara and the others, and each one has their own story, their own unique perspective, I would say, and their own way to to help us, you know, because that is why they are there, they are there to help us on the yogic path, you know. Uh, in whichever, you know, life we are, we need all of them, but some people will more need Kali, and other people will more need uh, others, you know, like maybe if you're very old or very ill, you may need Dumavati, for example, or uh, if you are an artist, you need one more, and so these things then, you know, can be a little bit personal. And when it comes to Kali, I would say, especially as we grow older, Kali becomes more important, you know? because Kali is dealing with the subject of death, you know? and in that way, the truth of Kali is the truth of eternity, the truth of eternal life, I would say, um, which is the truth that Kali brings, and uh, for those people who may not be uh, so much, you know, like acquainted with Kali, uh, I'm gonna try something new for the first time, sharing my screen and showing you Kali for those who have no uh, idea what she looks like. So, I think now you should be seeing that. Can somebody say yes? Yes. Yes, okay, okay. So, on one side of the screen you see the Goddess Kali with some of her helper energies. This is very typical also with Kali. She has an army of energies that are a little bit lower, of course, than Kali herself. They are kind of Shaktis, you know, and they are uh, helping her in her task, which uh, which is there, and um, typical uh, with Kali is this symbolism of death, which you also find on the other side of the picture where you have the yantra of uh, Kali, and you see the skulls, and you see the crow, and you see the uh, prairie dog, and you see all kinds of uh, symbols, also blood, and chopped off heads, and things like that, which have to do with uh, death. So that makes Kali a little bit a frightening image, you know? uh, and in that way many people, they don't really like Kali, uh, are afraid of Kali, while well, actually she is the one who teaches us that there is no need to be afraid. You know? There is no need to be afraid because of who she is, and who she is, is life. You know? She is the life force and uh, she is standing there on uh, Shiva, who is her, her husband, her spouse, uh, she's standing on his body, no? and this, uh, okay, in, in the stories there's many explanations about why this is there, but the most basic uh, symbolism of this is that Kali, as the life force, she is the one who brings the body uh, into life, no? who makes it alive. And so she's standing on it to show that she is totally above it, on top of it, no? 
uh, ruling it and that without her, uh, even Shiva, he can do nothing. No? So, in that way, uh, Kali is very, uh, very essential in, in the understanding of life. No? When we talk about the Self, we can talk about the unmanifested, you know? but the moment that we go into the manifested, then we need something more, right, to, to understand it. And so the first thing to understand here is the eternal nature of life. You know? And that is Kali. She is the life force. She is in that way also uh, the prana. And uh, she is in that way also our mother. You know? who gives us life. You know? She is often described as the, the mother in whose womb we are all born. But at the same time, she is also the mother, let's say, um, who devours her own children in time. You know? As time passes, at some point, we come back to her, we die. But this death is an illusion. This death is only to, you know, like allow us to hit the reset button and uh, start with a new body and, and a new life. So, um, now she's like the mother who in the morning dresses her child very beautifully so she can go out and play. And then the child goes out with the friends and plays and gets into the mud and maybe through some, uh, I don't know, mock fighting, uh, some, you know, tear is there in the clothes. And so in the evening, you know, it's all done and then, then okay the child is undressed it goes to sleep for a while then in the morning it wakes up and the mother gives a new dress no? uh, freshly washed uh, everything nicely done and uh, so in that way again a new day can start a new life can start uh, in the best possible way so in that in that sense we have to recognize life as being eternal and uh, this as just being like a a transformation, a reset button, a possibility to start anew. You know? This is very important also if you look at all, I would say, your troubles. You know? <laughs> uh, just imagine that you would live eternally but carry all those troubles from past lives with you all the time. You know? I'm not saying nothing is there, sure, something is there. But uh, at least some you know, new body we get, you know, with a clean brain where there's not yet any neural patterns being formed from, well, both good habits and bad habits and nice thoughts and less nice thoughts. So we get like a reset and, and that's the beauty of, of death actually, you know. Um, so in that way, when we can see through this image and not be afraid of the imagery of the uh, skulls, of the blood and everything, and can really see this as life, no? as a symbol of life, then we can overcome the fear of death, which is the first chakra desire, you know, to have immortality, then actually this immortality, we get it. No? And why do we actually want this immortality? Because it is the truth, of course. No? Every person somehow wants immortality. Nobody wants to die. I mean, except some people who feel very bad, but usually people don't want to die. So that is because we know we are eternal. And in that way, you know, through Kali, we can learn that and we can overcome that fear and, you know, get rid of the blockages of the first chakra, which is already quite something. You know? A person who is beyond first chakra has no more fear of death whatsoever. You know? Sometimes even other people need to protect them or they might just cross a street without really looking at the traffic or, or something like that. You know? I've known a few people like that who are really totally beyond that. And so uh, that is what Kali uh, can, can bring us. So Kali really is the goddess of yogis. A little bit you could say like Shiva is the god of yogis and uh, helps us in this uh, transformation in the spiritual growth. And uh, many of the famous yogis of India have been devotees of Kali. And maybe most known is there uh, Ramakrishna, who uh, was from past uh, century, um, 
very important figure if you look in terms of scriptures. So this uh, Ramakrishna produced so many important uh, scriptures and was also the teacher of Vivekananda, who was then the first actually to bring yogic philosophy to the West in, in any major way. No? He's the Indian teacher who at some point was even allowed to speak in front of um, Congress in the United States, for example, and give there a very special and uh, at that moment, a uh, very revolutionary speech, uh, you know, about the human condition. So all this uh, very important and I'm not, I was not surprised, let's say, to hear that also Ramana, Papaji, uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj, all these people somehow had a connection to Kali, even though they were not Bhaktis, they were Janis. But still, some bhakti towards Kali was there because Kali is teaching. No? Kali is a teacher. He is not an easy teacher. No? Uh, the one who worships Kali cannot expect life to be very easy and simple. No? If you want that, you have to worship Lakshmi, or one of the other more Vishnu-related deities. But uh, if you want to learn, if you want to grow, and especially also if you want to overcome some of the things inside of you, some of these blockages, some of these attachments, Kali is, is, uh, is the way to go. No? But with Kali always there is a kind of a, let's say, sacrifice needed. No? And the sacrifice is of course of the ego. No? The sacrifice is of our attachments. One of the stories in which Kali appears is when Shump and Nishump, two demons, they are, let's say, dominating the world and dominating the heavens and everything. And then she comes to, to defeat them. And they are two very basic uh, attachments uh, where we are forcefully, um, either forcefully taking something or forcefully removing something, pushing something away which we don't uh, like. No? So she comes to defeat those. And uh, in that way, she will uh, ask uh, from us also to defeat our own demons, to defeat our attachments and to let, to let go of them uh, and come to a state of non-attachment. You know? So it is very definitely what, what Kali is teaching us. If she teaches us that we are eternal, that life is eternal, it does not mean that we can hang on to whatever it is we have in this moment, right? That's exactly, you know, what is then stopping us from seeing this truth. If we get attached to this body, if we get attached to the things that we have, if we get attached to our relationships, if we get attached to our jobs and our titles and all these things, then uh, obviously, yeah, there's no letting go, there's no detachment, there's no growth, and there's definitely no view of eternal life. No? It, the view of eternal life only comes when we start paying a little bit more uh, attention to you know, who we are as an individual and become very flexible in that. You know? So it's very much to do with, uh, with the ego and... Um, for me as a healer, Kali also is very important. I'll explain a little bit more about that. But I can definitely say that when I wrote this little book called uh, Love Your Ego, that this was very much in response to the teachings of, of Kali. You know? Because there's a very big difference between loving yourself as an individual, not just as the cosmic self or something like that, but as an individual, as you are today, but at the same time uh, accepting, totally accepting the impermanence of yourself as an individual being, as you are here and now in, in, in this world, you know, with what you have and with what you don't have. That is something that really we have to be able to, to let go and not start... Um, claiming anything, you know, and not start holding on to anything, uh, but still, you know, as compassionately maybe as we try to love others, to also love ourselves with the same unconditional love, with the same compassion, and uh, be detached, you know, from those things uh, to which we tend to attach. I mean, the tension, the tendency to attach is very natural. No? That's also I explain in the book. 
is very natural, but at the same time we have to be aware of it, that it only brings us suffering. Because the nature of time is that everything always changes. So something which comes, it has to go. Whether today or tomorrow or in one year or in fifty years, it has to go. So in that way, whatever attachment we have there, it will only bring us pain. So to avoid that pain, we try to remain detached, while at the same time being fully involved with whatever it is we are doing, being fully, let's say, into the role that we are playing, whether we are teaching or being a father or a mother or a cook or whatever it is that we are doing, we are fully attached, let's say, there to that moment to, you know, trying to make the best of it, make the best possible apples. You remember maybe the story about the apple tree and the mango tree. Um, but, uh, yeah, accepting maybe, okay, next life is then the mango tree or maybe it's just a pine tree. Yeah? <laughs> not getting attached to what is here. Now, in, in, in this moment, not attached to our partner, not attached, you know, in, in all these ways, while at the same time being, you know, the best possible partner and making that uh, love relationship uh, as, as, as great as, as possible, you know, because that's what, what life is for, no? It's definitely uh, clear in, in uh, when we talk about Kali that she is not the, the person who is going to tell you, oh, you have to give up on life. No, she is life. She is bringing life. No? She is the life force. She is making all this theater possible. No? But at the same time, she teaches you, okay, enjoy it, but don't get attached. No? And this, this has so many different uh, aspects. Uh, also, in, for example, how I like work with myself as, as a teacher. You know? Uh, I'm very careful not to get attached to any of that also, no? so I mean no fancy dresses, uh, no different name, no? many teachers they have um, some nice sounding, spiritually sounding name, I, you know, I never will do that, I never want to do that because that's just creating one more problem, <laughs> then that's another thing I have to let go. So, no, 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 no. Uh, no maha this or master that, you know, that's uh, very important to me. People think, when I say that or when I do that, people think I'm very humble, but actually I'm not humble at all. You know? That's also not what Kali will try to teach you. Kali is very powerful, very strong. So also through the healings, the kind of energy I get is very strong because I have to defeat something, you know, which is creating problems. So, in that way, uh, I am very far from humble, but I am very careful. There's a difference, you know. I am quite confident about who I am and who I am not and what I can do and what I cannot do and what I know and what I don't know, I, you know, uh, no question. But I don't attach to it. It's very important. You know, a person who today attaches to being, let's say, wise, might get Alzheimer no? later in life. Then what problem will that give? No? A person who today is very good in yoga asana, you know, can do very special postures. If that person, you know, nothing wrong with being able to do that. Very great, you know, great. But getting attached to that is a danger. It's not careful. Because you don't know what's going to happen. Maybe, uh, you know, you get some kind of disease, you become very weak and, and you can't do all these things anymore. Then who are you? If you want these things to be taught to us in a way that is, you know, like relatively uh, easy to handle, then we have to be careful in, in our attachment. So that is really what, what Kali is, is teaching us with a lot of love but also with clarity, with very clear images. You know, one of these skulls that is hanging around your head, that's yours, you know. That's your skull which is hanging there, she's showing you. So this is part of, of the practice to not be attached and see the impermanence of everything. And I would even say, enjoy 
the impermanence of everything. <laughs> because, you know, every job that we have, everything that we can do, in a way, is also like a burden, right? It's like an obligation. Yeah, if, if you're a good teacher, then people come to you for advice. It's like a burden also. It's a job. No? Or you're a healer, people come to you with all their problems. It's a, it's a job. So the impermanence of things is such a great thing, actually. No? Because you can do something, but you're not bound by it. You can stop it whenever you want. No? You can just evolve and, and become something else. And that is also so important in that story, that if you understand the impermanence of everything, that you also allow yourself to evolve. The people who think they are wise, the people who think they are, let's say, uh, great teachers, uh, they usually, they stop evolving. They can no longer go to another teacher to learn something new, because they feel like, oh, no, no, I'm the big teacher, you know, I shouldn't be, you know, but every teacher is a student also. Every teacher has a teacher or more than one teacher. So in that way, you know, looking at yourself as something which is always evolving and in that way impermanent, you know, makes for a, a great life story, makes life very interesting. You know, you don't get bored in, in, in that way. Whichever, you know, stage you are in or phase you are in or age you have, always something new is waiting around the corner, as long as you don't get attached to what you already have. As, you, as long as you are willing to drop that and look what's behind the corner. You know? So, in that way, I think Kali is great. And uh, the working uh, with, with Kali uh, will give you a very different perspective on life and yourself and your desires also. Because being so much connected to death and life and reincarnation, and in that way also the spiritual world and your own, you know, uh, spiritual journey, in that way also she makes everything very calm. You know? This is one of the things which for me personally has been the most beneficial of my healing work, that is through working with the spiritual world, like almost on a, on a daily basis, I become very convinced of the existence of it, which of course is something difficult you know, to be convinced about. Because, yeah, you can't see it, you can touch it, you can, you know, there's, there's, it's something beyond uh, the senses. You know? So, but I remember some time ago, I really, like, fully realized the existence of that world fully realized the truth of reincarnation and that gave me such a great relief because suddenly nothing was urgent anymore. Like we have this sense of urgency in life about the things that we want to, you know, do and have and that is because we have such a limited view of life. But once you can see yourself as beyond death, as beyond just this life, as having so many lives, as being actually an eternal being, then that urgency, it goes. You know? And that realization was very clearly, you know, there's not an intellectual realization. No? That came much, 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 much before. It's just a, like, deep knowing. Huh. I really am not limited to this life. Whatever I'm not going to have in this life, even though I want it, is really not an issue. Because, you know, I can always have it in the next life. You know? So it gives a very different perspective to work with Kali, but also it gives a lot of peace inside of you, because you become one with time. You become really timeless and you stop getting attached to that which anyhow is impermanent and and has to go. You know? So, as I said, Kali is time. Actually, the word Kali also means black or dark, which is about her complexion, you know, and also 
indicates how Kali helps us to work with, you know, whatever is dark inside, you know, really helps us to fight those demons, let's say, that we have uh, inside. But Kali also is the female form of the word for time, you know, which is Kala. And Kala is another name for Shiva. And Kali is a spouse of Shiva. You know, Kali is actually, depending on the story, either Gauri, the, let's say, first wife of Shiva, or she is Parvati, the second wife of Shiva, which is the same, actually, reincarnated again. And uh, so Kali is time, and as time, she is life. You know? She is the life force, because it is the life force which creates time. When there is only pure consciousness, let's say, and there is no manifestation, then there also is no time, because nothing changes. To have time, to have a perception of time, something needs to change. You know, like when we watch the clock and we see the arrow move, then it gives us the perception of time, or we look outside and we see trees move and birds fly and all these things, then we get the perception of time. So when there is only pure consciousness and pure energy unmanifested, there is no time. But time is the first thing. That's why Kali is said to be the firstborn. Time is the first thing that comes when manifestation comes. First there is no manifestation and then there is manifestation. So that means something changed. First let's say there was nothing and suddenly there is something. Then immediately comes with that the perception of time. And so, to see that connection of time and life, time and the life force, time and creation, is very, very essential. And one of the main ways then to work with Kali is to work with Prana. So, Pranayama very much belongs to working with Kali. And this comes in a number of ways. First of all, to just observe the breath, as many people already are, are doing, you know, when they are doing some meditation practice or pranayama. So to observe the breath is to observe life. It is to observe time. It is to observe existence and to observe this existence as being permanent. Okay, we can say, oh, 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 when we die, then the breath goes. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> but at least uh, in this life, when we observe the breath and go a little bit beyond the incoming breath and the outgoing breath, and we start seeing like the permanence there, we see this, you know, this is the first way. And the second way, is of course then in Kumbhaka, when we stop the breath. That is a very, very important yogic exercise. I've talked about it quite a lot in, you know, the class uh, or the series on meditation. How to stop your breath is very essential practice and brings you into timelessness. When we are stopping breath, very easily also we can stop thought, because thought needs the energy of breath. And then time changes. In very deep meditation, when breath is completely gone and thought is completely gone, we experience really timelessness. Then we have maybe the perception of meditating for five minutes, but afterwards, when looking at the clock, maybe it was one hour. That is very typical what happens, and that is very much a practice that also relates to Kali. The understanding of the relationship between thought and breath and time. So, when then we even go further, and we start working with that Kumbhak in a way that activates the Kundalini energy, then, of course, we come to the most essential practice that is related to Kali. Because Kali and Kundalini, they are one. 
Kundalini is really that essential pranic energy. It's not the same as prana, but it is derived from prana and it is, you know, the most essential part of, of prana. When we start working with the Kundalini energy, then Kali can really manifest. And manifest inside of us, that means that our consciousness is becoming more elevated, moves through the chakras and the, to the higher centers, so that we get a better view <laughs> of this permanence, impermanence of things and ourselves and so on. So, Kali Shakti really is Kundalini. And in that way, Kali is related to prana, to air and also to lightning. No? And this lightning is related to Kundalini. This feeling of, let's say, electricity in the spine. Um, which is Kundalini when, you know, it's a long story, when then it enters in the Brahmanadi and really moves up, then our different consciousness comes. You know, we become aware in a different way of the reality uh, that we are and that surrounds us and, and everything. You know. So, very much also related to Kali worship and to Sadhanas that relate to Kali is working with Kundalini and also this um, shaking of the body because of the power of this lightning that comes, you know, which brings you into a higher state of consciousness. You know. And this same uh, energy, this same lightning, you can say, also has very strong healing powers, which is why I said before, that being a healer, Kali is very important. No? And for me, actually, Kali is what they call Ishtadev, no? the preferred form of the Divine. Which is not to say that the other forms are wrong or, or not good or something, only that I have a personal liking to Kali as the, as the preferred form of, of the Divine. So, in that way, uh, this working with the energy of Kundalini is very much part of, of the practice uh, uh, with Kali. And uh, when talking about practice, of course, we can also, I would say, in a more jhanic way or in a more contemplative way, work with Kali as time, experiencing timelessness as we, you know, meditate. That already requires some capacity to stop mind, of course. But, okay, if we can focus, if we can hold still, we usually need something, right, to hold on to. We need something. We need something to focus mind on. I explained that in the meditation series. So, talking about Kali, that thing which we hold on to is time. You can say we hold on to the passing of time. You can also in that way say that we hold on to the now, no? the power of now of Eckhart Tolle, this story, very much here is related to Kali. Somehow Eckhart Tolle he is a devotee of Kali, whether he knows it or not, I don't know, but you know, his devotion to the power of now very much is a devotion to Kali, if you look at it from the ancient uh, practices of, of India. So that is a very, very good practice, of course, to always like, follow the time in the now. No? So, there are many different ways to do it. I would say the more simple way, but not maybe very effective way, is just to be in your you know, meditation and go like now, 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 now. You know, always bring yourself back to now. No? But of course, as long as you are using a word for that, this word takes time, <laughs> so it kind of destroys the reality of it. No? Uh, but okay, it can be a way to start, it can be a way to work with it, to follow time, uh, like more in terms of pieces of time, no? which then we call seconds. Uh, uh, and so now, 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 now. This is a very, uh, well, very much uh, possible not to do. But of course, if it becomes truly silent and it is just like a awareness on which we are uh, focusing, then we are just aware of our beingness, which moves through time. And in that way also, it doesn't move at all. No? It stands still always in 
uh, in the eternal now. No? Because, okay, this little bit philosophy, the past is past, it does not exist. Eh? Uh, the future we can only imagine, it does not exist. The only thing which actually exists is now. And if tomorrow will exist, it will exist also in that same now. No? So that is the truth that we are looking for and that is what we can meditate or contemplate upon and uh, bring us in this more timeless uh, state. Mm -hmm. So this is as far as meditative practices go when we work with uh, Kali. Uh, one practice which definitely also is, is related there is to see death everywhere. <laughs> it's a bit morbid maybe, but uh, a good practice uh, for a while, let's say if you are sitting somewhere having some chai, uh, looking at the people in the street, walking by, uh, you know, looking in nature also with the seasons, uh, you know, always be aware of this impermanence of things. See that all these people walking by and you of course also sitting there, uh, are, you know, going to die. But that this is, you know, something which you accept, which you even enjoy, which you even love, because you know the truth of it, that dying is an illusion and that life anyhow moves on. So then this stream of people becomes very beautiful. No? Some will be children, some will be old people, some will be middle-aged, but still tomorrow they might die. Hmm? So, to see that and to see this as an illusion, no? the idea is not to be uh, even more afraid of death than, than we naturally already are. No? The idea is that you are there, observing the world around you and seeing the truth of it and accept that this, let's say, a little bit terrible part of it, the frightening part of it, the ugly part of it, is actually nothing real. And that it is, you know, very beautiful to see, like if we are walking in a forest in the autumn time and we see all these leaves lying down on the floor in all these colors that they then have. We also don't feel like, oh, you know, how sad all these leaves, they are dying. Because we know in springtime, new leaves will come. Mm -hmm. But so when we look outside to people and life, we should see the same thing. That whatever dies, it will come back anyway. In some other form, which then also, like for the leaves, you know, allows a fresh start. Like just imagine a leaf which lasts forever. But meanwhile, some animals may have, you know, eaten part of it and some birds may have shit on it or, you know, <laughs> in different ways it becomes, you know, used. And uh, so, no, no, then at the end of uh, summer, beginning of autumn, the, tr the tree, it can drop them and start with these beautiful, fresh new leaves in springtime. So, same way for us, you know. In that way, Kali is like the tree, you know? and she is always bringing, you know, this renewal, this transformation that, uh, that is life. Life and death, they go together, but life is the truth. Death is the illusion. That is the main thing to understand. And that is the main, uh, how should I say, uh, Mahavidya of Kali. And this truth is absolute, as absolute as the truth of the Self. When we look at how Vedic philosophy sees this, like from a universal point of view, then sure at some point, right, comes Shiva and he dances his Tandava dance, and the whole universe goes up in flames. No? So then we can say, oh, but, you know, then there is an end. But the story goes on. That only happens to allow a new universe to come. First there is some period of rest, and then again manifestation comes. So it never stops. So that is a absolute truth 
as absolute as the truth of the self, as absolute as the peace of the self, which is there in life. So if you can see this truth, we can see through that veil of death, if you can see Kali, the life force, from the beginning of time till the end of time, which does not exist, I mean, timeless, then perception totally changes, right? And your outlook on life will totally change. And then using the practices will also make it possible to live that change, because it goes a little bit against our nature, because we so easily believe in the illusion of death and pain, and let's say, forced detachments that seem part of nature. We have to let go of this one who died. We have to let go of that one who just left. <laughs> These things are, you know, life. Whatever comes has to go. Only for something else to come instead. So in that way we get peace and timelessness and no urgency. And it's so much easier to fulfill our desires only like when the opportunity just comes naturally in Dharma and we don't have to force anything and can in that way then also fully enjoy it while fulfilling a desire where it is forced, where it is, let's say, stolen, is never very rewarding, right? Always has like a bad taste to it. So in that way we become more calm, and more happy, definitely, and truly timeless. So, I think that more or less sums up what I wanted to say about Kali. And next week we'll talk about Tara, which is also a beautiful truth and a beautiful path in itself. All right. It rests upon a wrong understanding of the nature of suffering. And of course, yeah, I fully understand okay. when you look into the world, uh, you see a lot of bad things happening, let's say, and then some of these things are quite natural, let's say, uh, like an earthquake or something. But many of these problems and sufferings are, of course, man-made. So that makes it all the more hard to understand and to accept. But the truth is, of course, that suffering does not exist, only the idea of suffering exists. Because the truth is that all suffering is only because of our attachments. If we are attached to our body, then for sure we suffer when something happens to the body or something threatens the body or the doctor says, oh, you have a cancer, maybe one more year you have, you know, like this creates a suffering in us because of our attachment to the body, which is an illusion, because we are not the body. I've just been explaining, we are eternal beings, and, you know, we cannot lose anything, actually. <laughs> well, except that to which we are attached. So, in reality, there is no suffering, but, of course, the idea of suffering is there, the, let's say, experience of suffering is there, and in that way, suffering does exist. But we should not be so much overwhelmed by it, by uh, forgetting the illusionary nature of it, and understanding that, yeah, people do feel that they suffer, just can make us then compassionate, you know, and kind to everybody, and trying to, you know, help whoever is suffering in a way that feels a little bit over the top, maybe, um, or, you know, whichever we can do, we can, we can do it. 
but um, truly that suffering is also always a blessing because the suffering always brings us to a certain kind of detachment and ultimately this detachment will be a blessing yes. for for that person no and will be very much a part of spiritual growth spiritual growth is not about acquiring something that which we think we have to acquire in spiritual growth we already have it spiritual growth is only about letting go of things so that, that which we have actually which is okay the self our divine nature blah 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 you know is can you know can really come forward but we are deluded by all these other things and in that way we don't see it no you can explain this in so many different ways as the koshas you know the different layers of our being which hide the light uh, which is inside no the light of the self so many different ways to to explain that but so the suffering i have a class called the joy of suffering on youtube i can recommend it to everybody who still feels there's a lot of suffering in the world and i strongly suggest that you change your view then no? if you really feel this is a world which is really bad and going from bad to worse and it's really not a place where you want to come back <laughs> uh, uh look at that class please uh, the joy of suffering is real that is yeah. real okay no? because in every suffering you feel okay. an uh, opportunity uh, no? to let go of something and in that way grow hmm? you know not being dragged downwards by it being able to lift up because of it you know? so we should smile whenever we are suffering and say thank you for giving me the opportunity to grow you know? so and then i think the original question of not so much liking the idea of reincarnation is is different you know? anyhow we reincarnate because we want to no? we are all here because we wanted to maybe not such conscious process as we are used to you know doing and deciding things that is true no the soul which decides to reincarnate is not not making a rational decision because for that you need a brain no it's more a power inside that soul a desire inside that soul which brings it back to to earth you can say in a more subconscious way but still those desires are yours you know those desires live inside of us and they are the ones who brought us back so we should not complain of being here you know? we came here you know? and we are free to go any day yeah huh? that's also quite true not advisable <laughs> to end it yourself but still you have that freedom you know so uh, you are here because you want to be here no people who get into real trouble like mentally and they start thinking about suicide it still takes a long time for them to reach that point maybe where they can do that because precisely inside of them the desire to be here is still very strong even though they don't like it here no <laughs> but still that desire to be alive is very strong because that desire is shakti it is the life force it is your prana it is you know it is your everything no and so in that way uh, truly we are here because we want to and whatever suffering is our own no is our own uh, attachments that are making us suffer and there also again we are free to let go or not and if we don't want to let go yeah we'll suffer more but sometimes we accept that like you know if you don't like suffering why would you ever fall in love with somebody or something because that somebody or something anyhow it will go one day so suffering is part of the deal no they should write that maybe in a marriage contract suffering is part of the deal <laughs> yeah but we still do it because we want to it's like children 
when they play a game, maybe they also hurt themselves. Like some games, like let's say soccer. If you play soccer, okay, you fall, you, you know, you hurt yourself. Still, they want to play. If they lose the game, they suffer because they lost. And sometimes that may create in a child like, oh, I don't want to play anymore. But the next week, the other kids want to play. Oh, yeah, 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 I want to play. That's how we are. It's a little bit silly in a way. But, yeah, whenever you feel in the complaining mood, think about this. You know? The suffering is your own and you are free to go. You are free to let go. Whether it is of this life or whether it is of that thing or that person or that name or that ability to which you have been attached. First of all, let me say that when we talk about Indian gods and goddesses and the stories, first of all, as a Westerner, I like to be a little bit careful because this is not my original culture. And it is very complicated. Because about the tongue, for example, why is she sticking out her tongue? There are so many different stories and different opinions in India. So why would I say that I know it's this or that, no? right? So one story which is there indeed is that Kali was called to defeat a demon and this demon had a very special boon that whenever a drop of his blood would fall on the ground, there a new demon would come. So that, you know, fighting with this demon is very difficult. Whenever you wound it, the blood, it creates more demons. You know? So then Kali was called and she was sucking up all the blood from the ground and also out of the body of that demon until finally he died. No? So this is one of the origins for the sticking out of the tongue. Another explanation for it is that in a story she is also fighting with demons and she is fighting very passionately and becomes in that way a little bit crazy, you can say. And uh, accidentally or not, again, many stories exist, uh, she steps on Shiva, no? showing that same picture then of, of uh, Kali standing on Shiva. Uh, and then she's supposed to like stick out her tongue as a expression of shame, of stepping upon her husband. No? So in that way, Many different stories exist. That last one actually is not so old. Uh, trying, if I may say so, but very carefully, uh, trying to somewhat reduce that quite feminist <laughs> look of Kali into something a little more uh, nice. So this is usually seen as a little bit how you say that, patriarchal uh, view on, on Kali. The way it has been explained to me by Harish Johari, because it's of course a very uh, typical feature, is that in sticking out her tongue, she is laughing. And she is laughing because she is showing us all these symbols of death. And she is laughing to say, hey, look beyond it. You know? And uh, don't get fooled by it. And I'm your mother and I love you and life is eternal. Mm -hmm. But so, that's just one view. Many different views are there. Why she has that. And definitely that tongue as a weapon you know, to like defeat this demon by sucking up his blood or licking up his blood is definitely the oldest story that I have seen and so maybe the origin uh, of it but we all have our own freedom in interpreting what this image means to us and um, the fearlessness of Kali for me personally is quite beautifully expressed by it like we stick out 
our tongue at death. Hmm? We stick out our tongue at all these problems in life. We laugh at it because we know they are not real. Hmm? We laugh at it because we know they are an illusion and that we can move beyond it and that actually we are already beyond it as long as, you know, we only don't know it, you know. But we can get to know it and when we know it, then we are fearless. Good, okay. Whichever, you know. There are some images of Kali also without their tongue sticking out, where she has like big fangs, teeth. You know, many different things there possible. Yeah, well, Kali is not consciousness that is usually associated more with Shiva. No? She is the primary energy, the life force, uh, which is the other side of consciousness. No? I've explained this in many classes, that consciousness does not exist all by itself. Consciousness exists by the energy. And so, in unmanifested form, uh, the energy then does not change, no? it's totally pure, it's totally ananda also, it's totally in bliss, no? unchanging, as is pure consciousness, and there are two sides of the same coin. So the ultimate truth, which you can call God or the Self, is actually energized consciousness or a kind of conscious energy. It's very hard for us to find a word that kind of brings these two very essential aspects together. You know? And then we just find a nonsensical word like God or the Self or something, which actually says nothing at all. You know? But it's still, yeah, then an accepted term for that which is beyond what which can be described. You know? When I say, oh, the ultimate truth is conscious energy or energized consciousness, I'm stuck no, in my concepts no, uh, for something which is actually totally beyond words and beyond concepts. No. This is something I can guide people in uh, how to work with uh, Kali. Um, in a more tantric way than I think you are meaning, eh? more in, in terms of ritual, um, how to get in yes, contact yeah. with that energy and how to get a certain support from that energy. Um, so I, I think this is more a personal question then, because for everybody it will be different how to do yes. it. Yeah. No? Uh, because uh, yeah, whatever yeah. is desired will be different and whatever also is the situation of the person will be different, namely also, you know, the time that can be spent on it and uh, whatever practice already has been before will also very much define what can be done uh, afterwards. But basically okay. the way to start any worship of Kali is the same as for the other uh, deities, meaning that we offer the five elements in terms of bringing some earth element as fruits, for example, and we bring some water and we bring some fire, you know, we light some lamp and uh, we bring some incense for the air element and we use some sounds and Kali mantra, um, you know, for, for the space element. So this is the basic way, um, but okay, depending on the person, this should be done in, you know, in a certain way that is, that is optimal. And uh, generally speaking, when we work with Kali, Colors black and red are uh, used whenever available. Like if I do puja for Kali here, always I use a red flower if a red flower is available. Hmm? And if no red flower is available, maybe some very dark flower is available. 
maybe some dark purple or something going towards black or, or not. And if all that is not available, okay, maybe I'll go for pink if pink is what I have. <laughs> you know, well, it's not so easy. But um, yes. this, this use of colors, of course, is not to be underestimated. Colors have an energy. And uh, some deities like, uh, let's say, Ganesha, you can give any color. Because they are, you know, Ganesha is beyond uh, all categories, so you can take any energy as desired, so that is not really yeah. important. But when working with Kali, then yes, these colors, black and red, are, are used and needed also to help attract that energy. But the main thing will be your devotion, your practice, the duration of it, with the mantra, I mean. And also, of course, your ability to bring the teaching of Kali into practice, meaning your own ability to detach from things, to let go of things. That is, you know, also going to determine how successful you will be there. You know? yeah. Maybe a good moment also to say in that, that um, working with Kali is advisable to anybody who has issue or a main issue with fear, who is worrying too much. And certainly if this worrying also is about health, then working with Kali can be very, very um, efficient to do. Um, aside of that, to choose working with Kali at a young age is generally not advised um, unless, you know, there are specific reasons. Um, and also, very generally speaking, it is advised that a lady will more work with a male uh, figure, let's say, uh, and uh, the male uh, sadak will more work with a female form. To create a balance, this is not an absolute rule or anything, huh? and definitely not something which is pushing you, uh, you know, in any kind of dominance, but um, this is natural way uh, is seen. So, uh, for ladies in general, if you want to go in that direction, let's say, Shiva and different forms of Shiva, like also Mahakala, which is the, you know, male counterpart of Kali, maybe less known, is a very, um, very logical. I also say this because Kali, I think, among the ladies, is quite a popular figure because she has this power, she has this strength, she has this passion. And so I can very much imagine that and ladies like to also like bring this energy inside of them so that they feel a bit more strong uh, themselves. But at the same time, it's not very usual to do that as a lady, except at a certain age maybe, where anyhow Kali and Shiva, they become very uh, logical to work with, no? as we are nearing death, as we are preparing us uh, ourselves for, for death. This is very logical to do. But anyway, uh, I can help anyone who wants to go a little bit more in detail there, but it is it must be personalized. This is not something you can just say, oh, like this, for everybody, same thing. That's really not how it is done. First of all, I like to specify when I say Kali is not a very logical choice if you are young, uh, in most cases. Um, that that's definitely does not mean that you cannot, in a puja, uh, have Kali there and, you know, also respect Kali um, as a yogi, that is very good. Um, anyhow, we are all dying from the day we were born. <laughs> so, somehow or other, 
even if we are not yet nearing older age, we all deal with death somehow. So somehow Carly also, she can be there and she can help us and do, we can do some mantra and you know. So I'm just saying to really start a serious practice with Carly is more logical when you are uh, a little bit older. No?